It's unexplainable being out in the wild and knowing that you have nothing to rely on but your guts and grit to get you through. The Yukon makes you check your soul. It makes you check your inner gut. It lets you know who you are. Being dropped in the middle of the Yukon, right into the middle of a piece of God's country. That's where we belong. That's what calls us. That's what brings us back. It's the Yukon. There's something nostalgic and primitive about putting yourself up against 36 days of the Yukon territory. There's something wild and untamed about your soul that beckons to be set free for that brief period of time. And when you harness it, the journey that you're about to embark on will be the best ride of your life. In the end, the Yukon is gonna choose you. And when you're chosen, you have nothing left to do but to be alive. It's been over 2,700 miles since the drop cruise journey began, but in the minds of brothers Casey and Chris Kiefer, this year's journey is just beginning. Getting into remote parts of the Yukon can sometimes be half the battle. 
Having safely arrived at base camp deep in the Yukon wilderness, the task that lies ahead of them starts to take shape. For the next 36 days, each brother will be challenged more than ever before. Since the days of the Great Klondike Gold Rush in the late 1800s, the Yukon landscape has been the demise of many of men. Its landscape is dotted with signs of past attempts to domesticate this wild territory, most of them unsuccessful. The towering mountains are uninhabited by any sane human being, and they reek of danger at every turn. For Casey and Chris, this is the ultimate test. Unlike Alaska, where you can hunt certain species of animal without the assistance of a guide, hunters that wish to take on the Yukon must be accompanied at all times while in the field by a licensed guide and outfitter. When the brothers learned of this law, they knew exactly who to call, Logan Young of Midnight Sun Outfitters. For over 10 years, Logan has trudged his way through the 12,000 square mile concession. He's been there, done that. Having an experienced wrangler like Logan along for the trip is sure to provide a much needed insight into hunting the Yukon, and more importantly, hunting the Yukon from the back of the horse. Pack horses are common in these parts of the Yukon, and they can be a hunter's only lifeline in more ways than one. However, traversing this landscape with a pack string of 13 temperamental mountain-bred horses is not a task easily accomplished. Each horse has its own personality, and none are without fault. But as with any good bird dog, the brothers hope to learn to love them for who they are. After all, horses in this part of the world can save your life when you least expect it. Each horse, whether carrying a riding saddle or a pack saddle, will accompany Casey and Chris from the oxygen depleted heights of Sheep Camp, back down through the willow choke flats of the valleys and everywhere in between. For hundreds of miles, the brothers will be in search of the coveted Yukon Slam. To successfully complete the slam, the brothers must take a sheep, a grizzly, a caribou, and a moose. No small feat considering the obstacles that lie ahead. Keeping themselves and the horses healthy and sore free is a must if the men expect to make it out of the bush whoa, unscathed. Whoa, 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 whoa. I haven't left base camp yet. We're still doing what you need to do. Check your guns. Going into sheep country, we gotta shoot our rifles before we take off out of the horses. And good thing we did, because uh, the gun was shooting dead on when we left, and it's about six inches low now. So we gotta make some adjustments, get back after it. As the brothers fire their weapons for the final time at a lifeless target, the preparation down at the tack shed gets underway. For the first time, the brothers get introduced to their horses and begin to familiarize themselves with their mountain-born 4x4s. They don't have the luxury of rafts this year. They got four-legged beasts. I'm some ready. Those, some of those horses are big. Big horses. Horses. I hate cows, but I'll take a horse. <laughs> All right, we got the journal entries back again. Man, I missed having the journal entries. Dropped Project Yukon. What an amazing place this is. What a completely different adventure we're about to embark on. We're, uh, we're excited about it. I'm excited to be back in this country. It's like once you've been here once, it just brings you right back and you just wanna be back at home. We're almost one year to the day. We're like 10 days shy of one year of getting dropped off for the first time last year for Drop Project Alaska. And, you know, this year we're in the Yukon. Things are a bit different. Casey and I are used to doing things on our own, and uh, we decided that we were gonna do the Yukon this year. And by law, you have to have a guide with you. You know, we looked at this project and, and 
really wanted to find a home for it for a year too. And if there's one place that can rival everything that Alaska has to offer, it's right here in the Yukon. So, uh, you know, Alan and his crew have been gracious enough to open up their entire concession to us, 12,000 square miles of territory that we have all to ourselves. You know, last year we relied on the river and the water a lot. And this year we get to rely on the horses. The horses are all new to us. We've got a uh, hundred some odd miles by horseback. So we really have to be conscious with what we're packing. And uh, you know, it's just, it's got a different feel. It's, it's really cool, really unique. We've got some skilled guides with us that know this country and uh, they're allowing us to do what we do. And I'm excited to work with them. I'm excited to go on this epic adventure, no question about it. This is gonna be one hell of a ride. Got to spend one night here at, uh, at the base camp basically and ready our gear before we set out for 30 days, 30 plus days out there in the middle of the vast territory that the Yukon is. This place has got such an aura about it, you know, between the gold mining and the prospecting and everything that went on here at the Klondike and the gold rush. It's just, you know, this, this place has been the demise of so many people for so long. You know, it's, it's one of the last untamed places on earth and we're getting ready to tackle it. We're out of here in the morning this is night number one. We're spending it in a little trapper's cabin. But uh, from here on out, it's in the Alaska tent and tarp. We're gonna try and go through 30 days of the Yukon in its realism and what the Yukon has to offer on a horseback hunt in the middle of some of God's country. Dropped Project Yukon. It's just beginning. The sun rises on day two at Heart Lake Base Camp. Brothers Chris and Casey Kiefer both know that by day's end, they'll be in sheep country. Normally we're packing the rafts right now, but this is a little bit different. This first day out of base camp, we're studying everything. Pretty much just watching exactly what they do because we got a long way and a long time to do it. We got to jump in and pull our weight. Down here is the first morning we're actually heading out today, but we're trying to kind of pay attention to how these guys are doing this. They're getting the horses saddled up and everything, and grasping a few and shoeing a few so that they're ready for the trip. 30 days out there is a long time, even for a horse, so we got to make sure that everything's just right with these guys before we take off. You know, there's different leaders, mares, and the ones that they bunch up with and they like, so if you can stake them out properly and hold on to certain ones, then it'll help. But they all got different personalities. So old, old Mayo's the boss. Yeah, Mayo's the boss, and Casper, that mare over there, that gray mare. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, old Mel. As the first of the pack boxes begin to fill up, the hunters keep a watchful eye. Packing horses in the remote Yukon is a tricky game. If there's too much weight on one side of the pack saddle, sores can rapidly develop, rendering the horses unable to carry a load.
Every pack box is carefully weighed out to ensure the proper balance and fit for the pack saddle. Each hunter's setup is the same. Two pack boxes and a top pack on their pack horse and one small day pack on their backs. Soaking it all in, Casey and Chris are learning the ins and outs of packing a horse properly in the field for the first time. Take it, take it, take it, take it. Take it. Yeah. While there's numerous ways to lash a load to the back of a horse, the hunters will need to become proficient at lashing a load under a diamond hitch. Yeah. One of the most sturdy and steadfast lashing techniques, outfitter Logan Young has had years of practice to perfect packing and packing in a hurry. Properly implementing a diamond hitch starts with the very first anchor point, the lash cinch. Improper placement of the lash rope to the lash cinch and a horse can buck off the pack boxes in a violent rage, damaging or destroying all the hunter's gear in the process. Yep. Yep. That's good. They're debating right now. I think Sox has got a little bit of an issue with his knee. So they're just uh, kind of looking him over right now to see if he's all right. It's one of the things when you're working with horses, you know, you gotta just con continuously just keep an eye on them because they could twist a knee, they could do anything. And we're still in base we'll camp, and it looks like socks is getting pulled. Well, I'll throw an extra pack style on him. Chris and Casey count down the minutes until they leave base camp, knowing for more than a month they'll be surviving the untamed North Country of the Yukon. They realize the magnitude of this departure and know the next time they set foot in this camp, they will be changed men, for better or for worse. Summer's gone by, the wind's coming down, the bags are still packed, and I'm leaving town. Tomorrow's good fortunes are forever a day away, away. I never wanted to bid you farewell Give me a reason to stay And I might just as well Or kiss me on the cheek Before I say goodbye Goodbye It's day two in the Yukon, and brothers Chris and Casey Kiefer are a few hours into a seven hour trail ride to their first camp in sheep country, Boulder Camp, but must successfully maneuver 2,000 feet up in Summit Easy Pass first. Just over halfway to Boulder Camp, the brothers stop to take in all the beauty the Yukon has to offer, and with plenty of grass for the horses, it's also a good time to let them refuel before arriving at the mountain base. From there, the men will have to get off their horses and ascend the remaining half mile straight up to Easy Pass. This valley is pretty awesome. Breathtaking, isn't it? Yeah. With just under an hour before the real work begins, the brothers ride atop their horses one final time, taking in the beautiful landscape. What do those lights in the city skies tell you to do? I'm too far to come and rescue you. Did you forget? All our memories Well Find that road That will lead you Back to me Every Every Thank you. 
Wow, these horses, I got a new respect for them. We're up there. We're at 6,000 foot, no, sorry, 5,200 feet. And uh, the air's getting thin. About three quarters of the way to the top here. And we got these horses with us, but they're a great tool, but they can only push so much, especially because we need them to last the next 30 some days in really good, healthy condition. If we can rely on them, you know, they're a great tool to have, but we're giving them a break right now, walking with them up this pass right here. It's a little too rocky and a little too steep for them. They're impressive though. Almost there. We just uh, just got up here. Got this little spring coming out. We're stopping, taking a break. Let the horses have a break. Get them a drink. Let them feed for a bit. We got this last little leg here in front of us still. It's pretty steep. Taking a break with my horse. Badge nasty, badger. We just climbed another thousand feet. I don't know, 800 maybe. Or we pass over into Castle Mountain, set camp for the night. Well, we just made the pass. This is unbelievable. And we popped over here and we got a ram in the, in the binos. So, yeah, I see him just on that shale. Yeah, right, right below it in a green little piece of grass. Yeah, I lost grass down there. Exhausted after the 2,000 foot ascent from the mountain base, the men finally summit Easy Pass, seven hours into the journey to sheep country. At over 6,000 feet, it gives them their first look at the rugged country they'll be living in for the next 10 days. Yeah, I don't see a lot of bone on his head at all. Minutes after cresting Easy Pass, they spot two rams, the first of the trip. Over two miles away, these rams are in no threat of getting hunted and by the looks of it are not legal. The brothers take the time to properly assess the rams before deciding to move on toward Boulder Camp. Just getting down uh, off this side of the pass. It's been pretty steep so far. But horses did awesome, man. These things are incredible. They've been really, really good so far. Bringing those horses down the side of that mountain, you gotta bring them down so carefully. And the key is to switch back them this way and this way, which I didn't really know at first. So after uh, old Badger and I got the hang of it, we dialed it right in. We got some time left though. Keep working on it. With the end to a long day on the trail in sight, the brothers make the descent off the mountain as they side hill the final hour down the rocks and shale. They arrive at Boulder Camp just under eight hours from when they left base camp. That's it. We're here now. We finally made it. We left base camp this morning. Unbelievable journey over here. Now we're in drop country. We're making a camp at this place, Boulder Camp, hence the big boulder. Something you don't expect to see as you come over the first pass, and there they are. Yeah, it's not as soon as you break the pass. About a seven hour ride over here. And now we're here for a couple days. Be able to get up on top of this ridge up here tomorrow. Do some glassing, see if we can't find a big one. What a beautiful spot. At this point in the hunt, the brothers have made the long transition from base camp, made the 2,000 foot ascent to Easy Pass, and 1,500 feet back down the mountain to Boulder Camp. Now in camp, it's time to set up the Arctic oven tent, home for the next month.
this is my journal entry for day two. I'm looking over and I can see Casey up on top of a rock, glass and sheep, which we have two of them in the sights already, day two. And I feel like now we're in it. I feel like this is the element, this is the time. I feel like now we're right here, right, ready to rock and roll. I mean, when you get dropped off totally different and you have to make your way as like so many stages and you have to make your way into the country uh, where you want to be hunting. We did that today. We crossed the pass at over 6,000 feet. We rode horses for over seven hours. Probably one of the coolest things I've ever done in my life. Just amazing. I mean, this country is truly breathtaking. Today was a big learning day. I needed to learn about those horses, how to pack them properly and how to tie them, how to get into it. And uh, Logan was awesome. He taught us a lot today and I sucked it in because we got 30 more days of this and I gotta pull my weight and we gotta be out here living it. Be alive, that's our slogan, be alive. I can't put into words how incredible today's been. It's just, oh, this place is something else, man. Today's my birthday, I'm 33 years old. And the only way this could have got better is if my wife and daughter were with me. Other than that, this was a pretty awesome birthday. Cheers. I'm excited. I'm ready to go. Tomorrow's a brand new day and we're getting after some sheep. Drop style. We're on our playground now. We're where the sheep are now. We just got to chase them down. Chris and Casey get a full night's sleep and rest their bodies from a long day on the trail, fully knowing the magnitude of this type of hunting and how it can break them down physically and mentally. First morning sheep hunting. We're just getting ready to head out of camp. We're going to head up and check this valley up here. Save ourselves a heck of a long walk going up there, huh? Yeah. Yeah, we're gonna go around. The weather's good, so we're just gonna head around and we got a big valley we're gonna check out, do some glassing. We Sheep got, hunting's different. If we got nothing there, we'll come back. Come around and go up on that ridge right there. We're starting out about 4,400 right here, 4,500. Yeah. So we're just gonna start, slowly start to make our climb. Let's go. It's the first morning of the hunt, and while anticipation is high, the hunters can't help but feel a bit apprehensive. The day's plan is to stalk silently by foot while glassing the rugged ridges and peaks above them. Sheep are notorious for perching high in the mountains, using their 10-power vision to keep a close eye on any predators attempting to approach from below. For the brothers, the next few hours will be spent behind the glass, searching, seeking, and learning the habits of rams, lambs, and ewes. Well, that's Castle right there. Castle Mountain. I, uh, I remember it from the air. It's pretty distinct. And it's, it's badass. It's big. And it's threatening. And those sheep will be at the top. Just popped around the, uh, the edge of this thing right here. We're getting our first look at, uh, big castle. That thing's giant. There are five rams sitting on the first ledge down sticking out to the right. We're just gonna kind of make our way out and around here. Keep glassing up this draw and see if we can see something. Ram number one. Just spotted one. We're gonna get up to these willows. See if we can take a peek up there. Get the scope out. Got the scope. Yeah, I got the edge with me. Scope right there, so take a peek. Just uh, spotted our first ram right here. He's <clears throat> laying way up there on that on that bench, kind of towards the top of the ridge. It's the only one we can see right now, but maybe other rams on the backside are a little bit further down. So far, so good. If there's one like this, is there usually, are they, do they, 
Like how there was two yesterday, but then there was one. A lot of time the solitary rams are either really little or really old rams that want to be by themselves. But. This ram just got up. He's looking hard left right now. The thing about these sheep is their vision is unbelievable. They have 10 power vision, so. I mean, we, you gotta stay way tucked down, out of the way. Try not to let them see you at all from any distance. What we're thinking is that ridge is right there. That sheep's on it. There's potential that there's more sheep right on the back side of it. You just gotta be patient and watch and let him play out if he goes over the back side. Then we go. If he stays right there, we stay right here. Kind of a waiting game. He's headed for some big cliffs, so he'll be out of our way. We're gonna side hill all the way along, and pop that top, and take our time, be patient. See if we can find the rams on the backside. It's the first day in sheep camp, and brothers Chris and Casey Kiefer are slowly making the ascent up to Marmot Pass, a rugged 1,300-foot ascent from Boulder Camp. It's decided that Casey is the first to shoot a potential legal ram, and it's here they hope to lay their eyes on one. It's tough out here, man. This is big, steep country. We left camp this morning. Went around that mountain and came up this backside. It's the first day, and it will whoop your tail. Legs are burning, lungs are burning. But it feels good. Hope there's sheep at the end of that line. It's tough, man. Tough. Didn't do it. Drive. Drives you. You look up and you see it and you're like, oh. And you just keep pushing and pushing. We're at the summit of this part. We still got a lot to go. About 5,500 right now. We got a crest behind us. We gotta take a break, get some water. Some of the hardest hunting I ever got, I can tell you that much. Staring a small band of rams in the face only hours in the hunt is not what the brothers expected, especially staring at them from above. In order to be legal, a ram must be eight years old or older and have horns that extend past a line that's drawn from the front corner of the eye to the front of the nose. To ensure that there are no mistakes made, the team carefully examines the three rams before grabbing a weapon. We just got up, decided to sit here for a bit. It's kind of glassing over here. They're just coming up this little draw. I can see them good right through here, and they're just about ready to cross over. Which one? Which one is at the back? The middle one? He looks like he's he got a much like bigger, much bigger body. body. Looks like he's got that lamb tip, doesn't it? On his left side. There they go. It looks like there's one light out ram in there that's broomed on his one side, but we've never got a good look at his left side to see if he's got his tip, if he's a legal ram. So. I mean, the smart thing to do is we've got sheep. Logan made a good thing saying, don't leave sheep to find sheep, so let's go. We're gonna go after this one here. Uh, I kinda have a plan for the rest of the day. We're gonna go up and check and see. We've already been all the way around this entire mountain, so we know what's on the backside. They're kind of, 
kind of trapped in a way. I mean, they can always run anywhere, but we know what it's like, so. Okay, he's got the muzzle loader ready to rock and roll. He's got the, uh, the traditions, so we'll see. We can get on this one close, and he's a legal good ram. It's hammer time. You ready? As the rams disappear behind the rock cliffs of the mountain, the brothers know if they have any chance at getting a closer look at them, they'll have to make up some ground fast. From Marmot Pass, Chris and Casey need to successfully side hill over a half mile to the point where the rams made the corner of the mountain. It's their belief these rams have climbed the rocky shale bluff and bedded down on the mountain face. It's mid-afternoon on day three, and the brothers find themselves in pursuit of a three-ram band they spotted as a glass from Marmot Pass. The rams cleared the point of the mountain, and as Chris and Casey get into position, they realize the only ram thought to be close to legal is bedded on a rock bluff above them. The backside of the ground is in that tallest peak. You can just see his head. We've got one of the three sheep spotted right up in this kind of crevasse. Area and go straight up. The guys are looking at him right now. The spotting scope. They got a better angle than I do. We'll see. Hopefully he's legal. He's just staring at us. Casey and guide Logan Young lay eyes on the ram just after he stands up from his bed. Now they need to determine if this ram is mature enough. Yeah, he's kind of looking down this way. Yeah, he's got us pegged. I haven't got a good look at him with that other side. It's that tough was, to see him. Yeah, that was the, the biggest ram of the three that we've seen. You think that's the biggest one? Yeah, that was the biggest. The other two weren't legal at all. No. He was the one that we were thinking could be. Yeah, he's the one that had that right horn, those broom, eh? Yeah. Man, he's up there pretty high. Oh, man. Yeah, I mean, he's a nice sheep, but... That's a pretty good sheep, man. That's a good-looking ram, but... I think he's young. I can see his... His rings, eh? They're like... Yeah. Pretty far apart. That left horn doesn't... I mean, it comes to the bridge of the nose, but... Just barely. Just barely. <laughs> Legal, but not old. Yeah, he's I think he's probably about eight. All right. That's pretty sweet. God, he's right there in the open, too. Yeah. Look at that. That's awesome, man. That's kind of all man. That's cool. Just standing right there in the wide open, 150, 200 yards. Yeah. Man, that thing's sweet. Did you get up? Yeah, he's walking back there. Yeah. Yeah, he just got up and turned around. Yep. Yeah. He's going. I don't know. I don't think he's really not what we're looking for. Maturity we're looking for. Still nice to see big ramps. Right on. I think we can do better. Yep. Finish so, out our original plan. Yeah. Kind of Look on the backside a little bit. Yeah. It gets the heart pumping though. That's cool. It gets the blood flowing. Man, they're sweet. That's awesome. 
As the golden glow of the evening sun begins to slowly fade, the brothers side hill back to Marmot Pass. In the eyes of the first time sheep hunters, today has been a success. It's not often that a hunter meets face to face with a band of rams. And while the men will soon put their minds and bodies to rest in Boulder Camp, deep inside they realize that even though they came across a band of rams today, the mountains in this part of the world don't give up their ghosts that easily. It's day one in sheep country, and brothers Chris and Casey Kiefer have made their way to Marmot Pass, 1,400 feet above Boulder Camp. Within minutes, a band of three rams were spotted, one of them close to being legal. After several minutes assessing the ram, it was determined the men needed to get a closer look after the sheep made the corner of the mountain. Successfully navigating their way almost two miles across rock and shale, the decision was made to pass the ram, which was legal, but not old enough. As the men study the ram, they take mental notes on the fine details of aging these mountain-born animals. The team must now stick to the original plan and backtrack two miles to Marmot Pass, then side hill another two miles to Zippo Pass to glass the backside of Castle Mountain in search of a mature ram. We had a uh, caribou just come out. Popped out of this valley here. We came across this big shale and we stopped to take a break. Came up out of this valley. Made his way up and disappeared, probably about a 320 inch bull, 330 inch bull. It's only day one, so we got a lot of time. He went right by where we were sitting when we saw those sheep. He's literally headed right there. So we're gonna go check the backside here, see if we can spot some more sheep and if not we'll go back to camp that way tonight cross back and go down that valley between these two mountains right here maybe get an eye on him shoot him if he was in bow range but he is far plus he tastes so good <laughs> not gonna lie to you i could eat some meat The men decide to continue to Zippo Pass instead of pursuing the mountain caribou, a decision they may regret. I got some, I got some hot spots working right now on these feet. We just got up to the summit of this giant cliff that we've been gunning for all day long. Finally made it up here. I just shed my socks and boots because I could feel that I was sweating so bad coming across the shale face, which was just brutal. And I could feel that I started to get, starting to get hot spots. Like, it's not a blister yet, but it's gonna be. So I'm trying to air them out up here. I hope that they dry a little bit before I put them back on. And hopefully on the way home, we're straight. So when you're sheep hunting, a lot of times you're doing this on your ankles. It's brutal. Just hit the top. It was a long, long way up here. But it's cool, man. We can see forever, see this whole bottom. See behind us. Forever. There's a bunch of different valleys over here. Just trying to glass and see if we can see something. These sheep kind of come in and out of these valleys all day, so. I did some glassing up here. No luck. That sheep country. Oh, blisters in my feet. Sheep hunting is not for the, 
off for the week, I can tell you that much. 56.17. That's our altitude right now, but I gotta put the boots back on and hope that my blisters make it back to camp. Good news is we're gonna go back a little way over here where that caribou from earlier cut in. Let me get lucky and I'll unleash a rage to the cage of a caribou. But for now, we gotta get back and just go to sleep, relax, get enough rest, because tomorrow's a whole new day. We'll hunt our way back, probably get into camp late. It'll be good. Sore, really sore. my release on. I got the wrath unleashed right now. Just because we saw a caribou earlier on our way back to camp. And since I drew caribou first, it was unfortunate that I didn't get one last year. I'm gonna go ahead and see what we can do on the way back. So I don't have to let one buck here. I'm just gonna be ready just in case. As the men once again enter Marmot Pass, they shift their focus on the caribou that was working its way up the mountain. But now it's a race against the clock as daylight grows short. I just got up this little hole. Got the wind in our face. Caribou, meat on my mind. Let's keep moving. Sheep country can take its toll on a hunter's body from the inside out. With the first day on the mountain nearing its end, the brothers begin to feel the effects of this rugged terrain. Besides having the two sheep at the <laughs> at the summit, the very at the crest of the apex peak of the castle there, and they've already flipped us the hoof once today, so I say we head back to camp. I cut across, cut down, dump into the bottom, and get out of here. Coffee. Ooh, coffee. I like you. Still nursing a knee injury from Project Alaska, Chris begins to have a major issue downhilling the final mile to Boulder Camp. Man. My knee is shot. This is brutal. Going up, I'm fine. Man, going down is bad. Really bad. Just shoot me right here in the mountain and leave me for dead. This is my ankle. Rolled it bad. It's 
give it a second. Roll it in one of these little. Yeah, I just. The men make their way back the final few hundred meters to Boulder Camp. A great day on the mountain quickly turned bad in a matter of seconds. All right, we made it back. I gotta tell you, I'm spent. Big time spent. What an unbelievable day. Unbelievable day in the Yukon. We got three sheep and we got on, saw a caribou, tried getting on that. I mean, we put on miles today, up and down country, but it's time to get unpacked. And I'm, I'm spent. I'm done. It's a long day, man. That last little bit was killing my knee coming downhill, and I'm just I'm done. I'm out. That's it. It's a long day. Don't forget this. <laughs> Gonna get some rest tonight. Sit down, have a cup of coffee, and figure out what the game plan is for tomorrow. All right, here's my journal entry is the lights dimming rapidly and I'm just disheveled. That was a great day on the mountain. Wow. Um, we hiked, big, big hike, several, several miles. Going straight up, we gained about uh, 1,800 feet in elevation. It was big. Coming back down was a different story. I was hurt box. My knees are brutal. I got bad knees and coming down, they are just killing me. Going up, I'm fine. But side hilling like that on those rocks and then coming back down, that was something. That was sweet, you know. That was awesome to go out there and see this country and get in, uh, get in the sheep's world it was really cool. Man, did we see sheep. Sheep hunting is not for the faint of heart, no question, but man, I'm looking forward to a bed. I need to get some rest. Tomorrow's gonna be a little different day. Legs are sore, back sore, a little bit tired, but you know, it's how it goes when you're in sheep camp, especially in the Yukon. I don't know, man. Welcome to Sheep Hunting 101. Here's a tip, get in shape. It's day four in the Yukon, and as the second day in sheep camp begins, a heavy fog and light rain sock the brothers in for the time being. There's no luxury of weather reports when hunting the bush, over 100 miles from civilization, so making decisions based on immediate weather is the only option. There's no weekend forecast in the bush. up this morning to a little bit of rain it's kind of nasty out clouds moved in although one nice thing about having this cloud deck is it actually feels like it's warmer hey eh? it's like it's a bit warmer than it was yesterday morning so just kind of sitting around and enjoying a little bit of coffee here this morning it's definitely warmer but I think the cloud deck's gonna move like the way it's coming where we were yesterday is completely socked in yeah. Hopefully this blows out of here, but there's no sense going up in this stuff right now. So yeah. for now we just hang out, have a little coffee. Kind of Hopefully it blows through and then we, today we're riding on the horses. Yeah, we'll go up this, go up this big valley right here. There's a couple draws off on the left hand side. Check those, see if we can see anything. As rain and fog continue in the upper elevations of the mountains, the brothers take this time to learn how to properly saddle a horse from guide and wrangler Logan Young. With more than 30 days still left in the hunt, the brothers need to be fully capable of saddling and taking care of their horses sooner than later. Okay, got that. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then your back stamped. Just don't have to have quite as tight. 
anywhere near as tight. You just have like that, and then you put your breast collar on. Right. Okay. Yep. Right. All right. Let's go sell yours. riding this guy today and he's really wide which means I'm gonna be in for a long day because I got short stumpy little legs get him saddled here well today today's a little bit different of a day the fact that yesterday we put on some major hiking some miles but today we're gonna use horsepower we got um, about three more draws several miles away we're basically going to take the horses, saddle them up, they're ready to go, we're going to ride down, and then we'll start glassing back up through these valleys, just using the horsepower, and see if we can't uh, get on some sheep down there, see if there's a big ram, so that's the plan for right now, saddle up, get going. Visibility changing by the minute, Chris and Casey ride into sheep country for the first time on the backs of their horses. Horses in this part of the world can make covering several miles of mountain country more of a reality. And still hurting from the first day on the mountain, the brothers' legs welcome the change of pace. As the sun begins to peak over the top of Castle Mountain, the men take their time to carefully glass a mountain face for a legal ram, which to this point has been a challenge to say the least. Today's been a little bit of a different day being on horse. We just rode up into this place called Lake Draw. Actually named for the lake in front of me, but unbelievable. It's one of the most scenic places I've ever been. Now we're gonna park here, just start glassing, just keep glassing this whole hillside because you never know what's gonna pop over. It's a good place to rest. It's gorgeous. This is the Yukon for you right here. That's fine. That's pretty amazing to be able to ride the horses up into somewhere like this and realize this is where you're gonna spend the next couple of hours glassing. I don't know what else to say. We got this little high mountain lake in front of us. Cliffs, grassy cliffs all up in front of us. Sheep heaven. Wait it out and hope something shows. Taking in the beauty of the Yukon is sometimes an afterthought with goals of a Yukon slam weighing heavy on the brothers. But this is time to reflect and take in everything the Yukon can provide them with, along with a hot cup of coffee and chicken bouillon.
With a few hours left in day two, the brothers arrive back at camp with a newfound respect for their mountain-born 4x4s. Being part of the daily preparation process for the brothers completes the circle and begins to give them a truer appreciation for hunting from the back of a horse. Uh, left side of Logan, about, like see the ridge of the left side of Logan? Yeah. Like sort of towards the middle top, right before that plateau. It's the last few hours of day two in sheep camp, and just minutes after their arrival back in Boulder camp, a ram is spotted. Where's he at? Uh, left side of Logan, about, like see the ridge of the left side of Logan? Yeah. Like sort of towards the middle top, right before that plateau. Boy, he flares out pretty well though, doesn't he? Yeah, there he is. Yeah, he comes right to his eye. The skyline or what? Yeah. Literally hunting all day, going miles down, checking each valley. Just roll into camp, the bed down. break off the, the packs. Down. Taking the saddles off the horses, look up, sheep. And he flares way out, doesn't he? And he's a ram too. Nice looking ram right at camp. After I don't know how many miles on a horse. And it's sheep hunting. Wasn't there this morning. As the men study this bedded ram from well over a mile away at Boulder Camp, they decide to move closer and get a better look. They also feel there's a chance this ram could have more bedded with him on the backside of the mountain. Well, we come around and we decided to come take another second look at him. He had a little hike up here, got a perfect view. But he's 671 yards away. Bet it up, he looks like he's dead on the side of the mountain. Sweet ram though, right out of camp. Well, yet another legal ram, but he's still just a bit young. Breaks by probably a half an inch. Probably a seven or eight year old ram. He's up there. I want to say 270, 700 yards. Thought he might have some, some partners with him, but he seems to be all by himself. So our battle for that ancient ram continues. Sitting in the tent waiting for uh, the fog to kind of blow out of here a little bit. Planned on heading up there and spending the night on the mountain tonight. But the weather kind of threw a monkey wrench into that, so we're just kind of sitting here hanging out for a bit, seeing if it clears up. Had a little bit of rain this morning, obviously. I can't get out there when it's pouring down rain, so. Hopefully it clears within a few. That way we can take off and get out of here, get after some sheep. As the rain begins to let up at Boulder Camp, the brothers step out of their tents to check the weather when the worst possible scenario begins to play out. Yeah, we're, we're in a sticky situation right now. We lost all the horses. 
We didn't lose them. They just had the mind of their own. They took off. It's one of the things you got to deal with when you're out here in the Yukon, because we could be in a really sticky situation out here with no, no horses. We're real far from anywhere. I got to go check and see if I can find uh, some tracks on this far side right here on this far hillside. Everybody else is kind of checking different areas. This could be bad. Well, we're in a pretty big pickle right now. It was pouring down rain most of the morning. We were inside the tent. We had the horses staked out over here and uh, the rain finally quit. We came out and the horses are gone. We're in trouble. It's day three in sheep camp and brothers Chris and Casey Kiefer find themselves in a very dangerous situation. All 12 pack horses have disappeared into the mountains of the Yukon. The brothers have split up hoping to find any recent sign from the horses. All right, well, this is a fresh track. The problem is I'm tracking horses. They've been all over this place. They were up on this hillside yesterday, so I don't know. It doesn't look like it's too fresh. I'm gonna keep going. Well, I came up, uh, come up so I could see straight down this valley, glassing, got nothing. Casey's headed a different direction. He's headed actually up to check the meadow at the top. There's just one little area we can't see back in there, but we're basically checking every nook and cranny. Oh, there they are. There they are right there. Yeah. Yeah, there they are. They got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There's more coming. We got 12 horses out here. They're coming back. That's why you have Wranglers. There's no way you can do this country without Wranglers. Wranglers that have their guide license and know what they're doing and know the territory. I mean, that had been Casey and I by ourselves trying to find these horses in this vast country. And then to bring them back, because right now there's no saddles on them. So they're completely barebacking those horses on the way back. They got to get them, know what to do with them to get them back here. They got them wrangled and they're all coming back into camp. That's huge. All right, I'm going back. I can see Casey, I think he just saw him right now. He's way on the other side over there. He just saw him. So that's good. Everybody back to camp, it's time to hunt. Oh man. Chris is over on that side of the mountain. I'm on this side of the mountain. And the horses are up there. Oh. Totally different world when you're dealing with horses. You gotta make sure they got feet. We're starting to run low on what they're grazing on, so. That's a good sight though. Horses coming back to camp. That could have been really, really bad. With the precarious situation avoided for now, Casey joins up with guide and wrangler Logan Young to congratulate him on the find and discuss the plans for the afternoon. It's decided the men will make a seven hour hike to the backside of Castle Mountain, a location not accessible on horseback. But this plan has one catch. They will be sleeping under the stars without the comfort of their Arctic oven tent. Now, preparation begins as the sun finally cuts through the heavy mountain fog. Oh, just readied everything. Getting ready to head up, go over that pass and get on the backside. We got the sun breaking here for the first time pretty much all day. So it's starting to get winter here pretty quick. So we got to make a move and today's the day. It is 20 after four. Ready? I don't plan on coming off the mountain tonight, so we're ready to stay up there. We got our sleeping bags with us in case weather blows in. But tonight, we're sleeping under the stars. We camp, you know, it's cold and windy. You know you're gonna have to shed a layer. It's a matter of time. I've reached that threshold. Let's hope I don't have to gear down the next layer. Logan's shedding a layer. Whew. 
much better. I stink, but I can breathe. Water is the heart and soul of survival in any mountain hunt, especially in the rugged terrain of the Yukon. As the men begin their ascent toward Zippo Pass at the base of Castle Mountain, they collect water in what could be the last available source. This is the last stop for water. And since we're going on the mountain for the night, you never know when you're gonna make it off of there. So, this is it. Fill the camelbacks up, any canteens that we have. And that's more weight, but I'd rather have weight than die of dehydration. There's three rams right above us, right here. Again, same three rams, different side of the mountain. Just gotta find those mature ones. These three are together, I'm sure the mature ones are banded as well. Together. With most of the 1,400 foot ascent complete, an unexpected water source is taken advantage of by Casey. After rains in the mountain high country, rocks with small depressions like this one provides a quick rehydration opportunity without using the crucial water reserves collected at the mountain base. That was a personal mission right there. Climb straight up. We're at the top of this peak. So now we gotta go all the way to side hill this and on the back side. Still got another quite a bit. But we dropped, we climbed, I mean, about a thousand feet. It's a lot. It's uh, 6.30. We just, uh, just got up the old Zippo Pass here. Came from way down in the bottom of that valley around this mountain, all the way up onto the face. Now we're gonna cut out and go around this edge, hunt the backside of this mountain. The sheep, I mean, I just can't get an old, mature, legal ram. I got young rams, eight-year-olds that are legal. I just haven't been able to find that, that 10 or older. So we're up here. I'm not leaving this mountain till I kill a sheep. We're gonna get after it right now. It's 6 p.m. on day three, and at over 5,800 feet, brothers Chris and Casey Keeper are 1,400 feet higher from where they started at Boulder Camp four hours ago. Now, an arduous task stares them in the face. They must side hill the remaining three miles across massive shale slides and loose rock and boulders to the grassy mountainside of their overnight camping location. The danger and risk of side hilling these steep mountains is extremely high. At any moment, a shale slide could give way as the brothers plant their feet in for traction. If a slide does begin, it could carry the hunters hundreds of feet down the mountainside at a high rate of speed. A mistake like this could most certainly severely injure the men, ending the quest for the Yukon Slam and potentially their life. With outcomes like this not even an option, each step is carefully measured as the brothers inch closer to their grassy side hill destination.
I just got to the top of uh, top of the ridge here. This is one of the draws that we looked over yesterday. We still got a little ways to go across this side hill, but it's been a long, arduous climb. We had to side hill across the pile of rock and shale. And it's just, it's time consuming. It just takes forever more than anything because you got to figure out exactly which rock you're going to actually jump to next. So just time consuming, but we popped in here, same young ram that we saw the other day is laying over on the side hill over here. So we're just going to kind of game plan, figure out what we got. At over seven hours into the hike, Chris's knee has reached its breaking point. The men have successfully reached the grass of Castle Mountain's backside, but still have over half a mile to reach where guide Logan Young wants to camp for the night. Now they have a decision of whether or not to push on as dark looms. Okay, then go. Do you want to take? I'll just make my way. Take a half hour and walk. I'll just, whatever. Just go and I'll figure it out. You just let us know if it hurts, alright? Stop. It hurts. Stop that. Don't stop it. If you can't do it, then don't do it. No, seriously, go, Chris. I mean, we don't have to go over there. It's hurting. We'll throw a little bag down yeah, here. We can just throw it down in there in the morning. I don't want to hold anybody up. Well, we got yeah, all day tomorrow. I mean, ditch right here. There's some good things we'll stay in here. It's like we're not gonna take as much sound. I want to go so bad. I want to keep moving, but I can't. My knee is not. It's My knee is literally saying, I can't, I can barely walk from here to the rocks. We side hilled for like, had to be three to four miles on that shale side hill and my knee, it just, it's done. It's at the point, it's the breaking point. I'm over. And I don't want to hold anybody back, but I certain, sir as hell don't want to get injured on the middle of this mountain since we've been hiking for the past eight hours. I don't know. This is where it comes to like, you know, I gotta make a smart decision for what's going on. And the smart decision for me is sit right here, rest my knee, and at daylight, get up and go the extra thousand yards. That's it. I can be the guy, but literally, if you can't go, you can't go. If I go this much down, this outside right here is gonna explode. If you can't go, you can't go. The decision is made to set camp, and with a full seven hours back to Boulder tomorrow, the team doesn't want to risk injury this far into mountain country. A broken leg or torn knee could mean days getting back to camp, a risk too high to take. Clear skies grow dark on Castle Mountain at the end of day three. The team has found a depression in the grassy mountainside to sleep in overnight. With muscles weary and energy needed, the men take time to warm some water for coffee and MREs. Even as the men fight the urge to shut down their systems for the night, they take a moment to look around and take in the massive landscape and reflect on what has been literally a day of many ups and downs. Well, Here's what we've come down to. We're splitting mountain house. We're staying up on the mountain for the night. Once this is gone, we're out. We're at uh, just about 6,000 feet, I think. Well, yeah, I right there. Yeah, 5,800 feet, 6,000 right there. We got our sleeping bags. We're tucked in this little nook, and this is it. Sitting here like a sheep. Just like a sheep looking down. And we'll start hunting from the morning right from here. So it's gonna be a long, cold night, I'm sure, but we're ready for it. I'm hoping that my knee was just at a breaking point this today. I just I couldn't I couldn't do it anymore. So I got it elevated right now. And uh, we're just gonna get warm, eh? Just yeah, stay get warm. Get warm, have something to eat. And... Not much grayling and food up here. No. <laughs> Nothing but rocks. So that's it. It's gonna put us in the Sheep country, though. Yeah, we're in. Yeah, Hopefully, it's all gonna pay off. Have a good day tomorrow if the weather holds. I'm hoping so. A lot of clouds in the area. Hope it's
it doesn't rain. Yeah. That would suck. That would not be good. It's gonna be a long night ahead of us. Long night. This is what sheep hunting's all about. <clears throat> you wanna kill a big sheep? Hike your living rear end off. Get to a point, spend the night. And don't leave the mountain till he's dead. That's it. Signing off from sheep country. Hopefully it'll be a good night's sleep. With temperatures dipping into the teens, the men rise with the sun as they slowly awake when the sky begins to brighten. That was an interesting night. We made it through the night. I woke up about 3 a.m. and the northern lights were unbelievable. Unbelievable. Unbelievable northern lights display in the middle of the night. It's incredible, but we made her, so it's morning. We're getting a little bit of energy here, mustering up some energy, and we're gonna take off and head over to that ridge. I'm gonna go see if we can find some sheep. Each day in sheep country is a mental and physical grind. As day four begins, the hope of killing a mature fan and ram continue to drive the brothers, but time is of the essence. Winter is coming fast to the mountains of the Yukon, and the pressure of finding glory in the high country could just be nothing but fool's gold. It's day six in the Yukon, and brothers Chris and Casey Kiefer are without a ram. After climbing 2,000 feet from base camp and side-hilling miles on loose shale and rock, the fourth day in sheep camp will definitely prove to be a challenge. After a night sleeping in freezing temperatures on the side of Castle Mountain, the brothers need to close the remaining 1,200 meters to the backside of the mountain to hopefully lay their eyes on the band of mature rams they've been searching for. All that way last night, came the rest of the side hill this morning, snuck up here, shoot her right there. Well, we don't know if it's a shooter, we got like 10 rams. Sheep, flustered. Before breaking the top of the mountain, the brothers quietly get their optics ready and get a game plan together if things need to happen fast. This is it, all that work. I mean, they could be lambs and ewes, but...
lights in their eyes. You can put this pawn scope on. It's getting clear. It's got, you just gotta get past that cloud. <laughs> That's why you never just go walking over, you know? Or just on this side, too. You never know, you know? I mean, I can't even see any. As Logan and the brothers discuss the game plan, 10 rams await on the backside of Castle Mountain, with at least one thought to be legal. But only time will tell if all the work getting to this point will be worth it. It's the morning of day four in sheep camp, and brothers Chris and Casey Kiefer have found a band of 10 rams. This right here is what we call the waiting game. Take a day and a half to get here. You certainly don't want to rush it. Takes a lot of patience, just there. As Logan and Chris study the ram's movement atop Castle Mountain, Casey moves into position. Some of those younger rams just got up. They're starting to feed and they're actually coming this way. They're hopefully gonna come right around, right into us right here. At this point in the hunt, patience is extremely necessary. As the sheep work closer to the brothers, they study the rams, trying to make that important decision on whether or not the ram is legal. When viewed from the side, with horn bases aligned, a full curl male has at least one horn that extends from the center of the nostril through the lowermost edge of the eye. Age is determined by the horn growth, which leaves fairly distinctive rings or annuli on the horns and allow the age of the sheep to be accurately determined. After more than two hours closely analyzing all of the rams, it's determined that none of them are legal. Can you hear me, Lord? I'm 
I'm so lost. Where do I belong? Oh, oh, oh. In sheep country, there are no guarantees. And as tough as it is to push on in the rugged mountains of the Yukon, they know there's more than four weeks to go in their journey, and their story can change in a heartbeat. All right, so we came, we saw, we did not conquer. It was close. We had a band of 10 rams, and uh, there was two in there, but it was just too close to make the call. We looked at them, we've watched them now for about three and a half hours. They've gone up the mountain, they're just uh, bedded way up top right now. We had sheep all around us, just can't find that one that's legal, it's too close to call, so. Too close to call, eh? Yeah. This is what it is, story of my life so far. But, we'll get her done. Well, the last thing we gotta do is the arduous trek back to camp, which is as far as I can see that way. Everything we did yesterday, we gotta do again right now and get back to camp. We've checked all these draws. We've seen a lot of sheep, no question. Just nothing that's nothing that's definitely legal. You know, it's right on that border. And Logan's not gonna make that call. I don't blame him one bit. So now we start the task back across the shale. It'll take us five or six hours to get back there. Yeah, it's about a six hour hike. So we're low on water, if not out of water. I think one of us has a little bit of water left, so we gotta run into some water somewhere. Along the way, refuel, Once we drop get back to camp. Side. Let's start the task. Tell me I ain't crazy from being crazy. I'm a rambling man, oh, that's on my mind. just got back from an awesome adventure, no question about it. I mean, we uh, we just said, you know what, we got a break in the weather, the seasons are changing, and we gotta go. And we said, we just gotta make hay while the sun shines. So we took off, we grabbed the sleeping bags, packed them on our backs, and, and we took off and we left. And we planned on staying out there and hunting, and we did. Man, I feel like I'm getting sick. Not good. <clears throat> Could be from spending the night in the mountain last night. <laughs> just at the end of the night, my knee just, it's, it's just terrible, it's brutal. I don't know how to say. I mean, the knee is just at its point, it's at its breaking point, which sucks, because we're, we're not that far into this sheep hunt. I thought it was gonna hold up a lot longer, but I got bad knees. There's nothing I can do about it. I mean, I got just bad knees and they're starting to worry me right now. <coughs> <coughs> and we spent the night on the mountain last night and uh, you know, that's one of the cooler things that I've done, spending the night way up there. You know, it's like 6,000 some feet, I think it was. <coughs> but, <coughs> As you can tell, I think spending the night out <coughs> out in the open air has got me getting sick. <coughs> I feel like pure hell right now. <coughs> we roll up on 10 rams. I mean, 10 rams and to not have a legal one. I mean, the one that was in there was so close to being legal. Oh, so close. It's heartbreaking. But, you know. If there would have been a legal ram in there, it would have made everything well worth that hike and well worth it. But I'll tell you what, I wouldn't trade anything for that night on the mountain. That was an unbelievable night on the mountain because 
the northern lights when I woke up and just opened my eyes and I mean it was it was a show like I've never seen before. We were we were high enough on the mountain and those lights were right directly over our head. It felt like you could literally reach up <clears throat> and just swat them with your hand. You know. And it's it's things like that on these hunts, you know, that uh, that make you realize that it's not always about just killing an animal. It all paid off when we got over there and we roll up on 10 rams. A band of 10 rams together for not one of them to be legal is, I mean, that's just bad luck. That's all there is to it. Tomorrow is a different day. We just made it back to camp right before dark today, hunted our way back. Um, and now we're, uh, we're just gonna get a good night's sleep and hopefully tomorrow we're gonna go for a ride. I guess, come rain or shine or whatever. I mean, right now, weather can't play a part of this. I mean, we just gotta get this thing done. I mean, I'm starting to get concerned now. Maybe there's still sheep in my future. We don't have that much time left here in sheep camp. Uh, hopefully this cold stays away, but that's the plan. Keep hunting, keep hunting hard. Try to get after it, you know. If we, if we can uh, hunt hard and hunt smart, maybe I'll find my ram. As the brothers settle in for a well-earned night's sleep in Boulder Camp, day four in sheep country finally comes to an end. With each day comes new hope for Chris and Casey. And as day five begins, the weather in the mountains of the Yukon continue to grow angry as winter closes in on the men. They know as winter nears, the rams in the high country will move out. Time is ticking. get a early enough jump on things but we'll see it's kind of weather's kind of got us socked in we got real low clouds but uh, we'll see we may switch the plan around a little bit just because of the late start so we can't exactly get out there and get after it when it's pouring down rain so we'll stick around have some hot coffee regroup and figure out a game plan the mountain walls of Boulder Camp finally reveals itself from the curtain of fog hovering as the rain begins to slow. And like clockwork, a sheep is spotted. It's 9.30 a.m. on day five in sheep camp, and as the rain begins to let up, brothers Chris and Casey Kiefer quickly move into position to get a better look at what they believe could be a legal ram, right at camp and low. Once in position, they must determine whether or not this ram is legal. Holy That's him right there. That's him right there. Like, like really low. Oh. 
As Casey lays his eyes on this ram, he looks legal at first glance, but each time he turns to give the hunters a different view of his horns, it reveals some unsure characteristics of a mature ram. Big body ram, lots of gray. The team continues to carefully analyze this ram. And as he beds down on the low mountain face, they believe that this ram does not meet the requirements of a fully mature ram. Oh yeah. Now you can just drop down and cough that creek and you'd be, be right on him. But that's how it happens. Man, that'd be a good one. Just cause he's low, you can get close to him. He's just not quite old enough. Bad day of weather. Yeah, right out of camp at like Amazing. right there. Hey. And he's like right, literally like right there. He's just not old enough. It's frustrating because you want to knock something down, but everybody does, but he's not old enough yet. The men once again walk away from a close to legal ram and as the fog begins to lift, Chris brews a final pot of coffee before they make a decision on what the plan is for the day. Where we're at in sheep camp, there's no, there's no trees. No trees, no wood, no wood, no fire. That's how that rolls. So we're using this isopro down here and trying to heat up some coffee, but man, it's, it's kind of rough because the fires we could use to dry stuff out, we could use to get warm up here. This high up, there's nothing. Just no trees. So we're uh, using gas right now. Hopefully as we go, we can start building fires, but right now like, there's nothing, no fire makes it difficult, especially on a day when it's raining like today, where normally you have the confidence to go out in it because you know you can come back and get dry. But up here, you're wet, you're wet. The rain stops at base camp and the brothers have made the decision to ready the horses. The plan is to trail the horses more than five hours to the only mountain they've yet to check, Fish Hook. On the way, the team will pass many draws that could hold sheep, so the plan will be to glass as they work their way toward Fish Hook Mountain. Three hours into the ride, they spot a band of rams. I just had to jump down and adjust my saddle, tighten it up. and. Uh... Logan was just waiting for me and looked over at five rams on the hillside. So we're just getting a glass on them. After analyzing these rams, they determined this is a band they've seen two days prior quickly dismiss the opportunity and move on toward Fish Hook. At 2 p.m. and still two hours of riding to Fish Hook, only time will tell if covering this amount of distance with limited amount of daylight will pay off. It's a risk that, at this point in the hunt, the team feels they need to take. It's 4.15 on day five, and brothers Chris and Casey Kiefer have finally made it to Fish Hook, covering over 20 miles on horseback in a little more than four hours. Almost immediately, they locate a bedded ram on the very top of the mountain. They hustle to ready the spotting scope as more rain begins to come down from the clouds of the high country. Back 
Turn around there. Oh, way up there. There he is. Oh, yeah, I see him now. I see him now. Easy. We just uh, pulled up in here on the horses. We've checked every single draw on this entire mountain face, including the backside over the past five days. Except for this one. It's the furthest ride. It's exactly... Wow. Four hour ride. But we're here. As soon as we get here, big ram up on top. Good stuff. You see him? Not sure what he is yet. There's a ray up. Wet. Cold day. This could make it all worth it. Oh, yeah. A little different. Is he moving? As the brothers get a good look at this sheep, the realization that this is a legal ram is beginning to become a reality. That's a long way back up into this drill. That yeah, was took forever. I think that we can't even see. Half the hump. Yeah, he looks. It's tough to tell because he's still so far away, but. That girl looks that big. Guy, that ram. That ram's got a broken leg. Does he? There's a good broadside of him right there. I don't know, he held his leg, but he was walking on three legs. I think he was on front left leg. It looked like it was, he was holding it. Kind of busted a little bit. Uh, he's definitely he legal. laid back down. He looks legal, hey? Yeah, he does. It looks like the nicest thing we've seen, man. Yeah. Should just drop in. He just laid down. He laid down on the broadside. Yeah, he's bigger than anything we've seen. Hold on, man. Shooter. Get up there and check him out, get a little closer, but. Get a better look. Looks I'd like say it more from, than likely. Looks like it from here. Yep. He looks like he's still real heavy right Yeah, see, when they get that mass at the bridge of the nose. Yeah. See, from this distance, you're not going to be able to see the last little bit of lamp tip. Right. Just because it's too thin. Right. But if you can get that mass at the bridge of the nose, that's the, Chances are. That's the ticket. I watched him, man. He hung his left leg. Yeah. He walked like this, and it looked like it was like hanging. hanging. And then he kind of sat back down. Give me a nice one. Yeah. Oh, he's definitely past his eye. It's exciting. He's facing that right now. Yeah, I need to free. We drop up here and then thick timbers will tie the horses up. And walk from there. On that side? Yeah, we'll take our rain gear off and our shafts and stuff. And yeah. Shed movement. Shed as much as we can. Right on, buddy. Let's do it. Let's do it. That's what I've been waiting days to hear. <laughs> Let's do it. This draw might just pay off again. We're gonna load the horses and take them up the valley a little bit. Come up here, come across into that thick timber and tie them up, and then just come across there and then see if we can't get on. 
Gotta get a little good look at him before I make a stop. Let's do it. continues to come down in the mountains of the Yukon as the temperatures drop below 40 degrees. And on the afternoon of day five, brothers Chris and Casey Kiefer have finally found a legal ram. Now they must move the horses and tie them off at the bottom side of the mountain where there's cover in the river valley. The men slowly make their way around Fishhook, continuing to keep a watchful eye on the bedded ram. Horses here. I got them tied up behind us. That ram's laying up there in that fog somewhere. We still haven't gotten a great look at him, but from our initial glance, he looked like he's a legal ram. So, as you can see, it's raining. It's been raining all day. So, we're gonna try and make the most of it. Get up there if he's legal. We're gonna sink one in You ready? The team must now cover 800 meters and get to the side of the mountain accessible if any sort of spot and stock situation will take place, while staying low and moving slow enough to keep the bedded ram from becoming alert. The team now discusses the strategy, and in this situation, decide that the brothers will split up for this stock to better the odds at making the 2,000-foot ascent a successful one. This is, this is gonna give us the best opportunity. It's just me, me and Casey. Let's go. If we, it's the best opportunity to kill it. If it was just you and a hunter, this is what you would do. It's a giant ram. It's an opportunity to kill him. I'll be your eyes and ears from here. See him when he's on the ground. And when you shoot, I'm just gonna spread right out the side of that. Right there. It's gonna come up like Yes, I'm gonna come up like a goat. Fuck there, watch this do this. Kill him. The brothers' final decision is to split up, and from the mountain base, Casey and Logan will ascend almost 2,000 feet to the summit of Fishhook, to the bedded ram's current location on the mountain face. Chris remains at the base, a decision he continues to grow more uncomfortable with. Casey and I are used to shooting everything together, and uh, he drew sheep first, and uh, you know, we were just messing around trying to figure it out. He reached in, drew sheep. Great, I got no problems with it. I wanted to kill a big one. You know, I mean, obviously we came here to shoot two sheep. And then we got a lot of days left. I mean, who knows what's gonna happen. Right now, this is the first legal ram we've seen. That's big, I mean, this is a big ram. It's 38 plus for sure. I don't know where he's gonna fall. 39, 40, somewhere in there. I'm guessing right in there, but we'll see. And the guys, the best way to do it was to split up. Logan and Casey took off up the up the side of the mountain. I'm gonna be their eyes and ears from here. I can see him perfectly in his body scope. He's pretty fixated on me right now. They're gonna make a trek around the back of the mountain and try to pop up over. And so we're gonna we're gonna see what happens here eventually. Down the mountain side. It's a steep side. 
A quarter of the way up the mountain, Chris and Logan push towards the summit, carefully placing each footstep on the wet rock and shale. It's 6.30 p.m. on day five, and brothers Chris and Casey Kiefer have finally found a legal ram. Almost halfway up the mountain, Casey and guide Logan Young pick their way through hundreds of feet of wet rock and shale that lead to the summit of Fishhook and the bedded ram. Meanwhile, at the mountain base, Chris watches very anxiously as his brother goes after the first element of the Yukon Slam without him. As Casey and Logan push the final few hundred feet, picking the final route to the summit is now the most important decision. Picking the wrong angle toward the ram could completely blow the hunt. As a massive fog bank begins to roll in on the top of Fishhook, Chris looks on helplessly towards Casey and Logan, knowing in just a matter of minutes, he'll have no more visual contact with the hunters or the ram. It's now almost 7.30 p.m. and being over four hours away from camp, it's almost a certainty that if Casey does kill the ram, they will be spending the night on the mountain. Possibility of hypothermia for the crew definitely increases as the temp falls below 34 degrees and rain sets in for good. Casey reaches the fog line at the top of the mountain. In just moments, he anticipates laying his eyes on the giant bedded ram, but the final stretch is crucial. Believing they have picked the correct line, they make the final push toward the summit of Fishhook.
As they summit the mountain, the bank of fog that has been working its way across mountain peaks all around them is now resting completely over them and the bedded ram. Carefully maneuvering around a rock ledge, the men attempt to climb high enough to get a visual of the ram. Anxiously looking from the mountain base, Chris has completely lost sight of Casey and Logan, and in seconds will also lose sight of the ram. situation here and the fact that huge huge cloud deck rolled in and I was watching the sheep I saw the sheep stand up and then I lost them and I lost everybody else I, I have no I have no visual contact with anybody at, or the sheep it's just a giant wall of clouds there's not a human not a sheep unsettling uh, this is the worst part because I can't see them I have no idea what's going on and I can feel completely helpless right now finally enabled to see the ram Casey and Logan have gotten in position for a shot It's day five, and brothers Chris and Casey Kiefer have finally laid eyes on a legal ram. As Casey and guide Logan Young carefully attempt the ascent of the shale rock face of Fishhook Mountain, Chris is left to watch 2,000 feet below. As they summit the mountain, the men carefully work their way around the steep rock face of Fishhook as the rain continues to fall from the cloud bank that has now found a home right above them.
See him through the scope at all. Not even close. Oh. You gotta be kidding me. This is the worst part because I can't see him. I have no idea what's going on and I can feel completely helpless right now. I don't know what to, I don't know what else to say. This is a waiting game that's completely helpless. Hold on. Yeah, there they are right there. Coming out of the clouds right there. What happened? feel much better, I can see him. I don't know what happened. I have no idea. Last I saw, the sheep stood up in the cloud deck, hit in, and then I saw them at the top, through the clouds for like a second. And now they're coming down this face right now. As fog continues to set in at the peak, the rain and sweat soaked men begin the descent down the slippery rock face. As the brothers have learned over the past few days, there's more to the Yukon than the massive landscapes. No different than the wilds of Alaska, Mother Nature in the rugged north country of the Yukon is relentless. Oh no, this has not been a good day in the Yukon. I gotta get back to camp, get dried out. I gotta go find out what happened. I me. All the way up there, 100 yards. Just couldn't see him. Oh, we saw him. Stand up and run. I saw him stand up. Like all like that cloud deck hit. And all of a sudden I saw him stand up and he looked to his left. He was just standing there forever. I felt like he was standing there for 10 minutes. It's a feeling in my soul that I got to get out of here. I'll let you know if you get up and go, you'd be gone, gone. I've seen trouble, a whole lot of trouble. Been down this road, far north of home. Sky is dark. So damn dark Yeah, I have trouble And it's on its way I'm so alive Yes, I know Some of the dangers of coming out here and doing this like this is because you gotta have some dry stuff Otherwise <laughs> We'll be, we'll be done. I mean, he was sweating like crazy. We gotta get into dry stuff fast. We got a four hour ride back. It's dangerous when it gets cold and wet. I mean, hypothermia fast can set in. With over 18 miles and four hours of saddle time remaining between the men and the salvation of Boulder Camp, they set out through the rain soaked bottoms, realizing that an arrival after nightfall is inevitable. It's unbelievable. So cold. My hand, that's wet. Can't even, can't even stand up. Casey's already in his bag. Casey, you all right in there? Huh? 
Is it getting warmer? Casey had to get wrapped. We just got back and I was soaked to the bone. Tried to put some dry stuff on after that stock and it just, it, nothing was dry. I was completely soaked for four hours on that ride. It's pouring down rain outside. Wind is howling, it's freezing. I just gotta get warm. That's all there is to it. The following morning proves to be no better as the men wake to heavier winds and snow-covered mountains. With wet clothes and sub-freezing temperatures, they know that attempting to hunt in these conditions would likely be a death sentence, but getting snowed in could mean the same. She left me standing with my heart in my hands, said, honey, honey, baby. <clears throat> well, basically we're snow's moving in, our stuff's freezing, we don't have our stove with us, so we got Coleman, we can boil water on, we got it fired up in here, and we got all the clothes hanging, and right now we're trying to make a decision, because if the pass snow's in, we're done, we're stuck, and it's snowing pretty good, but we finally found a legal ram, so do you leave a legal ram, hope you shoot him, pull the pass. I think no matter what happens, first we gotta dry out because we can't go back out there with wet clothes and freeze to death. For now, we're just trying to get as much heat in here as possible in this Arctic oven up top. Get all these clothes up top and let them at least get semi-dry. The remainder of day six is spent in the tent while the wind-blown snow continues to beat against the outer walls of the shelter around them. Today we're stuck in the tent. The weather's rolled in, and thank God, because yesterday was, uh, yesterday was an interesting day, there's no question about it. It's demoralizing when you're up there and you got it, you're that close, I mean, you get that close to that sheep, and then I couldn't see the guys. I mean, just a lot of things went on that was different. It was tough. I know it crushed Casey and Logan as well, because that was a big sheep. And today, thank God, the weather actually rolled in harder because everything is soaking wet and it stinks in this tent. I mean, it stinks like a locker room that I cannot explain. It's terrible, <laughs> but we're stuck in here, letting stuff dry out. The wind's just beating, snow's coming down. Hopefully this front moves out. Tomorrow's a new day. So looking back on it, I don't know. On one hand, I'm absolutely torn that we didn't shoot in case you didn't get that opportunity because that was an amazing sheep. And on the other hand, I think it's good that we're alive and we're here. Oh, well, the storm's passed. We weathered it. Um, we got snow at the top of all the mountains. Should be nice and easy to try and spot a dull sheep in the snow, but it's passed. We made it through the night. Horses are saddled, it's bright and early, and uh, we're gonna try and get a fresh start. It's definitely dropped in temperature. The sun's out though, which is just like a huge bonus after a couple of days of just rain and clouds. It's nice to have the sun out, so. Saddle the horses. Going on a long one today, and check all the draws and get into it. Hopefully we can find that ram again, or another one. But I'm feeling good about today. Sun's out, it's a good thing. Today we got uh, bluebird skies. A little bit of a different story when compared to the last couple of days of weather that we've had. It's been ugly, man. We had snow yesterday, we rode back, got in way late the night before. Rode through the fr basically freezing rain for four hours. Took yesterday to try and get our stuff a little dry anyway. We got a lot of time to hunt moose, caribou, and grizz after this, but we're trying to get uh, trying to get these sheep done and over with. We already got snow up in the high country up there on top of the mountains, which makes it even harder to see these things, but we're gonna use today and these bluebirds guys to get after pretty hard. Thank you. 
It's day seven, and as brothers Chris and Casey Kiefer ready the horses for a long day in the high country, the realization that they have just two days left to catch up to a mature stone sheep is very much a certainty. With temperature levels in the 30s, winter is most definitely on its way into the mountains of the Yukon's north country. The upper elevations begin to glow white with snow, and each hour that now passes is a lost hour. As time ticks in sheep camp, tough decisions will have to be made if the brothers' goals of taking the Yukon Slam remains a reality. The men glass each draw, hoping to spot a mature ram as they make their way to Fishhook holding out for the small chance that the ram lost in the fog two days prior may still be on the mountain. If he'd have come over here last night, where would he have actually popped over? He could have gone right back to the same spot. Yeah, I don't think he... Think well, the, well they do those, that. Remember when we crested the bridge there and looked into those cliffs? Yeah. I don't think he took off too far. So what's the plan would be to go up at the fish hook? Yeah, we're gonna go to those last willows up there. Yeah. Tie up. Hike up to the fish hook and we can look all on that back draw. Probably be a lot easier than going all the way around the fish yeah. hook. Yeah. Plus, if he's over there, we're coming down. Yeah. yeah. If he's over there, we're already up, right? Yeah. And then we can go around and do over past that saddle. Yeah. And we can look back on the back side too. Now nearing Fishhook, the brothers maneuver through a wall of rock and water before approaching the base of the mountain. The plan will be to tie off the horses and climb the remaining 2,000 feet to the summit of Fishhook, where the ram was spotted two days prior. check the back of this draw, but we had to stop here for a second, shed some layers because the last thing you want to do is get halfway up, start sweating really bad, lose a ton of heat that you have, and then try to get up there and get dry, and you'll be frozen. There's snow at the top, so, I mean, it's up there. It's colder, but we're shedding some layers right here, changing out everything. Gonna hit it up there pretty hard, see if we can pop over coming on the back side of where this thing was, where that ram was yesterday, so I don't know. See what it looks like when we get up there. Hopefully there's a couple of rams in there. The daunting task of a 2,000 foot climb, one full week after entering sheep country is no easy task. With bodies sore and weak from the abuse of the rugged Yukon terrain, the brothers will need to stay focused and have strength mentally to push up to the summit. The snow-capped mountain the brothers looked up at from almost a half mile below them is now under their feet as they slowly reach the summit of Fishhook. It's now imperative to stay warm without sweating, with heavier winds and temps now in the low 30s.
It's day seven in the northern Yukon, and brothers Chris and Casey Kiefer are finally nearing the summit of Fish Hook. They rode almost three hours on horseback from Boulder Camp and left the horses at the base of the mountain. They've now hiked over 1,500 feet, closing in on the peak of the mountain. Once to the top, they'll glass Fish Hook's backside, hoping to get a look at a mature ram. Pretty much where we stopped the other day. <coughs> Glass down over where that sheep was. <coughs> He's not there. <coughs> so we're, we're really high right now. <coughs> Having a little trouble breathing. The brothers finally lay their eyes on two rams, but need to move closer to decide if they are legal. Oh, we're just heading back down the ridge here. Stopped them through the spawning scope. I wanted to drop in elevation a little bit to get a better look at these rams. And the, one of these two rams is the same ram that we had in here the other day. But he's way across on that face over there. So now I gotta try to figure out what we're gonna do. From the position of the sheep, the team would have to drop elevation and side hill over mile on rock and shale to get within 500 yards of the bedded ram. But with several factors working against them, the task is just not that easy. I'm just looking at the cliffs below him. Yeah, like he's all right, right where he's at, but look at the cliffs below him. Oh, I see him. I mean, that's the problem is if he goes any further that way, we're screwed. Because once he gets into that, that's way too steep. We don't have a prayer in hell trying to get across that stuff. We got four hours of daylight to make it from here to there, kill him and get back. Ain't gonna happen. There's no way. It ain't gonna happen. That's far, man. Take us 10 times as long to try and side hill the whole thing because we gotta go half mile that way yeah, and then come back. Not to mention you have to side hill the whole thing. Yeah. Which is the worst in the world. Otherwise, we gotta drop all the way down this valley and come all the way back up to the elevation we're at right now and try to get one ridge from him without him seeing us. <laughs> I don't think it's I don't think it's possible. I really don't. I don't think he could be in a worse spot. I don't know. I mean, I don't want to back out because you got a sheep right here, but at the same time, I'm just looking at it going, given the situation that we're in, the daylight that we have, the temperature, the temperature that's outside. I mean, if it drops below 20 degrees tonight, we're stuck up here. This is what I got. Yeah. I mean, we weren't prepared to spend the night. It turns into a potential life-threatening based on the fact that it could be frozen. It could be, I mean, you get hypothermia quick. There's not a chance in in hell that we're gonna build a fire with rocks because there's no trees. No. I don't know. I don't like the scenario, I can tell you that much. I gotta think about this here for a minute. It's the afternoon of day seven on the top of Fishhook, and brothers Chris and Casey Kiefer have spotted the injured ram that vanished in the fog two days prior. With many factors working against them, the team must now agree on a plan. From their current location, the brothers would have to cover over a mile of rock and shale to approach the cliffs where the ram is bedded. 
This decision could mean the difference between walking off this mountain with a sheep or walking off fish hook once again empty handed. He's sitting over there, he's got a half jacked up leg. I starved to death in February and get chased down by a pack of wolves for 10 miles. I think an animal's got enough willpower that if he wants to get out of danger, he's gone. There's no good answer. No, there's no good no, answer. That's why everybody's like. Because no matter where you look at it, I'll give you a negative, and you can give me a positive, and I'll yeah. give you a positive, and you can give me a negative. There's, there's, exactly. There is no definitive. You're not going to turn my, turn me no matter what. We gotta be smart. That's the number one thing. We gotta be safe. There's no ram in the world. Worth get hurt. So, gotta make a logical decision, and I want everybody's input, and everybody decides it together. I'm not one to f let animals get away. Let's put it that way. <laughs> He's already evaded us yeah. one time. Yeah. We're lucky we found him again. He's, I mean, if you got underneath him, I mean, again, I'll, I'll find a positive to your negative. I, mean, I know. You know what I mean? Same here, but. That's what I mean. It, it, we're going to go straight at him right here, and you're anticipating him to run. We're going to go through that saddle. Why not come at him this way? And then that way, maybe he goes this way versus. I hope not. Oh, I don't know. There's just too many ifs. He's not in a good spot. He's not in a good spot, we're not in a good spot. We've had the <laughs> weather you can think of. We get one good day to try and kill a ram, and we find a big one that eluded us the other day when it was nasty, and I mean, I, there's nothing more I want to do than to run over there and lay one on him, but times like these and these kind of hunts, you gotta think about more than just yourself, you know? But we're gonna see what kind of angle we can get on them, if any. Try to make a decision from there. As the team inches closer and closer to the bedded ram, they keep a close eye, hoping he gives them the time to make enough ground to get a shot. Now at over 700 yards, using the terrain, the team feels they can close another 350 yards, getting close enough for a shot on the ram.
This segment of Drop Project Yukon is brought to you by Realtree. I put my 330 pin on him twice and just boom. I hit him the first time for yeah, sure. Air flying. Yeah, and then the second, I didn't think he was gonna make it up the hill. When he did, I chested him and just it was kaboom. It was like it's right to where. Yeah. He's better. Nice. Oh, oh man. man, dude, nice work. Logan, nice work. Big props, brother. Bro. We're gonna stick it nice out. Nice job, We're fellas. Stick it out. What? A stone sheep in the Yukon. Oh, After that's a big ram, man. Days and days and miles and miles. Oh. Holy smokes! Man, the old way we let him go over and then create that last 400. Oh, we're perfect. We got we dropped in here out of his sight. And he was over, feeding on that side hill, and we just waxed him. Oh. We started. Congratulations. Man. The next draw over and made our way all the way up and over, up top. Check those cliffs, check these ones. Uh, all that torment. Wax Up there on top Talk of that mountain, on the very peak, thinking. Physical. What are we going to do? Mentally challenging. What are we going to do? Weather. And we just said we got four hours of daylight left. Kept going, man. Let's go. You guys didn't quit. Let's Let's rocked it, man. Brother. Dude. Casey. Nice work, nice work all around. Shooting, nice work. That is a Yukon stone sheep That's right there. Nice ram, man. For the ages. You see him holding his leg? Yeah. The hurt leg? Yeah. What a ram to take. Right here. Look for blood right here. He didn't run out or. When I, I hit him, he didn't come out the bottom. Boys, you can quit philosophizing. Right there. Woo! Yeah, boy. Well, this is where I hit him with the second shot right here. We got over here. He came up on this top. You can see his tracks. I nailed him with that second one. And he went back behind this, this cropping in this little ditch right here, and we couldn't see him. I knew I hit him. But we got over here, and he wasn't laying, so we figured he rolled. Logan just went down to that point right there. I think he said quit philosophizing because he's laying right here. So let's go get our hands on him. As the team descends into the canyon where the ram lies, a few hundred feet separate them from finally putting their hands on a Yukon stone sheet. There he is. Oh. He had to give us one last hill to climb. He took a tumble, didn't he? Hey, oh, dude. Boy. Man, Check that out. Hold on. Look at that. Oh, yeah, man. That's a big old ram, man. <laughs> How old? Oh. 12 and a half. 12 and a half. Easy to count, 12 and a half. That's an old <laughs> ram. Logan, nice work, dude. You nice too, boys. That's sweet. What a ram, bro. Nice job, brother. Nice shooting. Thanks. That first one popped him, man. Boys, that first one hit him. Congratulations, Case. That's awesome, man. You guys, that's a heck of a ram. Look at that. You guys put a lot of work in for this sheep. Look at he didn't even break his tips off at 12 and a half. Old bugger. Drop Great Project Yukon. That's right. Project Yukon right there. Project Yukon. 
we kicking got off. Dropped. Lived in the mountains. That was awesome, man. Camping overnight, horses. Sleeping in the mountains. Tonight we sleep right here. We sleep. <coughs> sleep hunting's a whole other ball game. I can't believe we did that, fellas. That was awesome. That made it all worthwhile Maybe right there. Some teeth. Yeah. That ram, it feels like he tore his knee or something. His leg's not totally well. A little loose. Loose. And it's like his ten, tendon or his or, ACL or. Or a tendon or something. Yep. Look at that. It's crazy, isn't it? Unbelievable. It's crazy. That's the coolest animal and the hardest hunt I've ever done. Hands down, the hardest yeah. hunt I've done. It's a yeah, mind game, man. A, oh, totally. More mental than physical. 100% yeah, mental. Absolutely. If you can get yourself through the first 150 steps, yeah. you can get through the next 550. That's right. Just think, two days ago, that ram was bed up in those cliffs over there. Yep. And we were up there in the fog, like, I, I, I think the most disappointed I've ever been in my whole hunting career. I was pretty down, man. I was pretty down. I was not going to lie. Because I lost you guys. That was awesome. And now, here he is. Here he is. <laughs> think about this. Redemption. Four and a half hours ago, we were at the very top of that mountain looking at him over here. Debating. Horses, Horses are on that over. side. I'm glad we decided to get after him tonight. Yeah. There he is right there. That is a beautiful, beautiful fan sheet. On Pops, Northern Yukon. on Pops' birthday, man. Something about birthdays. Happy birthday, Dad. Happy birthday, Dad. Without him, we probably wouldn't be out here hunting. Nope. Not a chance. Uh -huh. That's it. People get you into it. I'm so happy. What a beautiful ram to take. Boy. Oh! oh. <laughs> Just feels good. Man. man. Feels good, man. That feels great. In a quest that began at birth, another peak is reached in the brothers' journey. But tonight, underneath the moonlit sky, they work together in silence. Few words are spoken as they cape and quarter the ram, and although they're thousands of miles from their families, they finally feel at home. It's dark on the top of Fishhook, and brothers Chris and Casey Kiefer have finished caping and quartering the ram and are now working their way off the mountain, almost three hours back to the base where the journey started over 12 hours prior. back to the horses, moved them down from those higher willows that we left them at down to a bunch of bigger willows so they can get some feed. We're down here by the creek so we got water. It's exactly 3 a.m. in the morning and we just got back. Got a good fire going. We go get some water and I'm going to sleep. A nice fire for heat not windy down here at all it's perfect so we'll sleep it out get up at daylight jump on the horses back to camp with the sheep on our back so much in my life. Really a 
a bed. It's just a sack, a warm outer casing, if you will. I'm tired. That was, that was one of the most intense things I think I've ever done. And they're literally ready to fall asleep standing up. Six in the morning. <clears throat> We're just getting up, getting ready to jump on the horses. Got a two and a half hour ride back. Overall, the night was pretty decent though. Got to curl up next to a fire here. It spit rain on us there for a little bit, but. Not too bad. <sighs> Last leg of the journey coming up. Well, we made it back. <laughs> it was 24 hours exactly. We left camp. And uh, we got about 20 minutes of shut-eye, if that, last night. So we're gonna take the saddles off, get these guys back out to graze. They did a lot of work for us today. That was a long ride. My knees are killing me. As day eight in sheep camp begins to wind down, the team settles back into Boulder with one day left to pack camp and head back down into moose country. But first, the task at hand is to cape the head of Casey's ramp before sunset. It's been a week of extreme ups and downs for the brothers, but with over three weeks left in the Yukon, much is left undone. And if early winter holds out in the high country, the Yukon slam the brothers covet could become a reality. It's day eight in the Yukon, and brothers Chris and Casey Kiefer are finally back to Boulder Camp, merely hours after making their way off the mountain, this time with a sheep on their back. Casey uses the last few hours of daylight caring for his sheep, while Chris readies the gear knowing tonight will mark the last full day in sheep camp. Well, as I sit here, a bruised and beaten <laughs> hunter, uh, I sit here victorious. I finally killed my fan and sheep. I'm gonna tell you something, that sheep hunting is not for the lighthearted. You gotta get after it. You gotta have the will to wanna kill something. You know, what a hunt, what an adventure. What a just test of willpower, just a mental game sheep hunting is. We left here out of camp at 10 o'clock and no intentions of staying the night. And 
all of a sudden, 10 o'clock this morning, we roll back in. And that's just what was led. That's what you got to do out here in this country. We got royally screwed over by fog a couple days prior to that in fish hooking. We just wanted to get back in there and see if we could find that big ram. And sure enough, we found him. I don't think there was ever any question that we didn't want to go after the ram. I think the question was, let's be smart about it. Let's really talk over our options. And we we booked it. We hauled, hauled it across that mountain, side hilled our way all the way over, and you know the uh, the rifle did the trick at 350 yards. And uh, you know I'm happy for Casey. That's a great sheep. It's an awesome trophy to have. It'll be one that we can definitely look back on and say that we, we earned it. We're all tired today, but we're getting our stuff packed up because we're out here first thing tomorrow morning. But, <laughs> starting to get sick. Yeah, it'll take its toll, no question. I'm 100% victorious in sheep country and that feels really damn good. Best 24 hours I've ever had hunting and the worst 24 hours I've ever had hunting, all wrapped up in one little nice little dropped ball. <laughs>Officially the last day in sheep camp. Actually uh, packing the horses right now, packing our gear, getting everything kind of spread out so that the weight's even for the trek back. And then we're out to moose camp, so. We'll still be in sheep country kind of randomly throughout, so hopefully Chris gets a crack. We saw one old enough legal ram over here and we killed him. We got a lot of animals left to go, a lot of time left, so. But we're officially out of here. Be nice to get into some different scenery for a while. We're packing up right now, getting all the stuff ready to go, putting the saddle uh, boxes on the horses, um, saddles, everything, moving camp. We're out of sheep country and uh, we're gonna move down lower um, out into Moose Caribou Grizzly. We got a lot of days left, but feels good to come out of here with a big ram, doesn't it? Huh? Yeah. In just 24 hours, guide and wrangler Logan Young will be heading south to the States to the university. After nine days of working side by side with him, the brothers know this is their last opportunity to learn a few final tips from the master wrangler before they head down into moose country. Keep your eyes on the setting sun, we got to keep on riding till the day is done. We can't find who we're looking for. Just camp tonight, tomorrow, look some more. If you will go well, stay behind them. But do whatever gives you peace of mind. For me, I was born to ride. I keep staring out the sun till my eyes go Now on the backside of Easy Pass, brothers Chris and Casey Kiefer begin their 20-hour journey south to TomTom, Tom, where they plan to spend several days. As often happens in the Yukon, weather is constantly changing, and just four hours into the ride, rain settles in. The men pull out their rain gear and take a few minutes to readjust and tighten the pack boxes. Horse Pass marks the midway point to TomTom. Tom. With rain continuing to fall and daylight fading, the brothers know they need to find a place to call camp for the night in the low country.
That was a long day of riding. Let's see. Had to be, yeah, nine, ten hours of riding. And uh, in the rain for the first half. But we still haven't reached our destination, so I'm gonna set tent here for the night. Got a bunch of big draws behind me, bunch of stuff up here. We're just gonna try and find a flat spot, set tent, relax tonight, get up and do some glassing, and move on. Keep moving. Spent, I'm hungry. After deciding on a location, the often not so easy task of finding a flat spot for the tent is now at hand. I don't see a flat spot. No. Anywhere. No. It's gonna work for this tent. Yeah, I don't know. It's just for one night, so. Yeah, I mean, if it's got a slant to it, it is what it is. I mean, we just gotta get, <coughs> stay dry, find an area. The good thing is there's a pile of pine in here. There's a lot of good dead stuff right there. Too. All this caribou moss that was usually dry is wet. So there's, I mean, for tinder, you know, all this stuff is soaked. But there's a bunch underneath. Oh, there's dead pine all over. Yeah, there's a bunch of like spruce boughs underneath. We can use that. <clears throat> It'll be fun. Right, figure out where we're gonna put. Set it up and build a fire. With the nightfall quickly approaching, the willows and tussock formations make it difficult for the brothers to find a suitable location for the footprint of the tent. I'm almost thinking like right here. Yeah, that'll work. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. All right, let's put over here. Let's lay the footprint down and then from there we can kind of plan out how this is gonna work. Just finishing staking out the tent here. <coughs> Rode into uh, Moose Camp today. We've been pretty much riding all day in the rain. <coughs> but finally got in here to camp, so get this tent set up. I'm gonna go grab some wood right now. It's nice to finally be down in some country where you got wood to burn. So you can stay nice and warm. We didn't have any in cheap countries. <coughs> so I'm gonna go grab that right now. A tin pan morning I heat my coffee A brand new day Give me a spark of fire Today's a today's a big day for us. It's a changeover day. We are uh, changing out. Logan's got to go to university. He's got to go to college. So 
because he's bummed out, but he's got to go. And uh, this second leg, we're getting into our comfort zone as guides, and our comfort zone is hunters, moose, caribou, grizzly, lowland animals. So um, they've uh, they've sent over uh, Jesse, uh, a very experienced guide in this this area that we're in, and um, and Brad, uh, a very experienced wrangler. Uh, with a guide license uh, for legal reasons um, I, you know i've been struggling with this the whole time it's one of the things that uh, is uh, different is being able to literally be guided i'm not used to that you know and it's just it's it's a little bit of mixed emotions for me in the whole guide thing because so much of what we do is is being out there on our own and doing it our own way and being on our own time and you know, being able to, to make our own decisions, but uh, you know, Jesse has been has been cool enough to literally say, "Hey, man, you guys do your thing, and and I'm with you. If you need help, I'm right here next to you." It can cause a little turmoil because you want to uh, you want to do it yourself. At least I know I do, and Casey and I are so used to that, and uh, it's different. It's taken some getting used to. For us last year, being on our own time and doing our own thing was what it was all about. So. I'm excited to get back to that. I'm excited to get back to the one that, that's calling the shots and making the decisions on where we move, when we move, how we move. It's still difficult though, based on the fact that I just want to go and do our thing. But it is what it is. You know, we're getting back into the country that we're familiar with and the, the style of hunting that, uh, that I think that I've got a pretty good grasp on you know, the moose, caribou, and, and grizzly stuff. It was one year ago today that Casey shot a caribou on the mountain in Project Alaska on his son's birthday. Two years in a row now I've missed his birthday. Missed his first birthday last year. When we were in Alaska, it was a little different scenario than today. It was pouring down rain, just as cold, but it was pouring down rain. <clears throat> We set out that morning and uh, killed old maniac. One year ago today, I killed old maniac. Happy birthday, Ryder. Your dad's doing great. He's got a big sheep down. It's the third of September. It's sunny. It's my little man's birthday. Happy birthday, Ryder. And I'm ready to go. The sun's peeking as I'm speaking. I like that. I'm a poet. I don't even know it. Well, we got to, got to pack the horses up, leave camp. We're headed into moose country. We got Jesse and Brad with us, and uh, we're gonna get these pack boxes on in the moose country, and we're gonna set camp for a little while, which is gonna be nice to be able to get there and set up. So, easy boy. This is the hardest part, just packing up the horses. You're good. Yeah, you're good. Some of these horses don't like getting top packed, so you gotta just kind of ease it on them. Just kind of block their vision a little bit, so once it's on them, they're usually pretty comfortable. We got to get this uh, tarp on them. A lot of times they don't like going on, but the key is you got to have the diamond at the top, and there's an art form to it. I mean, the way that you throw that over and, and how we got to loop it and get it tight, and that diamond on the top, the tighter that is, the, the better it's going to hold. Pretty good here. Pretty the last of the pack horses are loaded and ready for the all-day journey to TomTom -tom, as the early morning sunshine gives the brothers new hope and optimism. Just 20 minutes into their trail ride north to TomTom, -tom, Chris and Casey spot a flash of white in the high pines above them. 
The brothers scramble to get off the horses and get mobile. I could have swore that looked like a freaking move. I know. Because the first time I saw it, it was high. And the second time I saw it, it was way lower. And I was like, that just doesn't make sense to me. Oh, yeah, there's two. There's one to the right. There's one moving to the right, just to, just to the right of that. Like on this side of this tree. See these trees right in front this of us? Side. This side, that lane? Yeah. In that lane, there's another one. There's two moose there. We were coming down the hillside. We haven't left camp more than five minutes. Casey saw something white up there. I tried glassing. Couldn't really tell because the horse was moving. Then just as we were popping out across this river, I caught off the top of my right. I saw a bull moose, 100%. Really up in this timber, and all you'll catch is a paddle. It's bright white because it just shed out. Yeah, you see his front foot. Real tan chest. Yeah. Real light, light. Really tan. light color. Black legs, but really light chest. There goes the other one right there. There, he's low now. He's just over the top of Kate. See, yeah, see yeah, him There he is. Looks like there's moving right there. Looks like they're coming. He's right there. He's moving. See him? It's day 10 in the mountains of the Yukon, and brothers Chris and Casey Kiefer are only minutes into their trail ride north when they spot two moose in the timber above them. I'm going to set up the scope. We're on kind of a downward side of him, downwind, and we don't want to go attack him right here, but we don't want to waste energy and time either, so what we're going to do is get a good look at him and see if we can't wait him, see what we got. There's two bulls up there, maybe even three from what I can see. We're going to try and get a good look at him here first. Yeah, he's looking like a pretty good bull. I see him right there. I know it's just so hard to see from here because it's so thick. I can't see him right now. Man, they're up on that hillside though. That hillside is thick. Can you see him? Yeah. Yeah, the one on the left. That one walking right there? Yeah. Yeah, I know he's not a shooter. He didn't look like it. That other one on the right, though, that one's way further left. That other one's over here more. Well, he's raking like crazy. Well, there's two bulls up there, just like we thought there was. And they're, uh, they're sparring right now and just kind of messing around with each other. Looks like one is a decent bull. Um, the other one's not. The other one's a smaller, younger bull. We're really trying to get a good look at this one because he's uh, looks pretty good, got good front. It's really thick. It's yeah, last, last I saw him was just going up to that thick stuff. Yeah, they sparred there for a minute and then they turned and went. What do you want to do? Go around? We can. Well, the wind's, the wind's brutal right now. It's blowing right up there. This wind sucks. I'd like to uh, shed this coat, get a different direction on him. We can ride the horses around this edge right here. That, never even see us, unless they went up a little higher, but I don't think so. Yeah, but if we get, if we jump on the horses, and we take this out and around, we'll change our angle a little bit, so yeah. we can see in there real good. Yeah, I know, because it's looking can't back. See in here. Yeah. Should be able to change it enough to where we'll be able to get a better look at them. Yeah. All right, well, let's do it now, pack, and just jump on and ride over there, just keep our eye on this hillside, right. and then uh, get over there and see if we can't put another eye before we make a big hike. I mean, this moose hunting is not just about killing a moose. It's about hunting extremely smart because he's on that hill face right there and he's up there another 800 feet from where we're at, uphill. We can't get the horses to him, which means if we shoot him there, then we're gonna have to pack him from there. So patience, watch him, see what he's got, get a good look, make sure it's worth it. And go. We got meat. Not worried about eating. Well, we got two hind quarters for sheep. This is only like the day, second day into that. We're good. This is good. This is a good start. We're not even 20 minutes out of camp where we slept last night. We got two moose. 
Let's keep moving and get around here. As the men climb atop their horses, the decision is to work around the bottom of the mountain using the Blood River Valley to conceal the team while keeping a watchful eye on the bull moose above them. With a brutal wind, this is the only option, and with only one of the bulls determined as a borderline shooter, this move will get Chris and Casey to a location where they can get a better look at the bull before moving in on him. This plan, of course, can go awry in a matter of seconds. Okay. Chalk went up for rodeo cowboy, apparently. He hit the tree. I tried holding on as long as I could on it, but his halter actually snapped off his face. He got loud. Now we got a problem because all the weight slid underneath him, and we can't get it off because all the weight's pulling down, so we're going to have to do something here pretty quick to get this horse free. We got the halter back on him. It's just a matter of unleashing him now. I got to tie up my horse and help the guys. It's a good horse. He kind of freaked out a little bit, but... <clears throat> Once he got his balance here on the hillside, he kind of settled down, stopped a little bit. It's life in the bush. The health and well-being of a pack string of horses takes precedent above almost any and all things in the bush, even a potential shooter bull moose. The noise of plastic pack boxes against the low pines echoed up into the high timber, spooking both moose off the back side of the mountain. The team works around the bottom side of the mountain, but realize their opportunity of getting a better look at this bull is history. As the men inch closer to Tom Tom, the seven hour ride is starting to take its toll on their bodies. Over the last two days, the team has covered almost 60 miles of rough Yukon terrain. The closer they get to camp, the more the valley widens, creating a prime habitat for moose. We can glass all the way two different valleys from right here and uh, plenty of wood. So just gotta find a place. Casey's not feeling real good. I gotta get tent up, fire built, everybody get warm again. Get Casey warm, just sweat it out hopefully. I don't know, it's not good when you're sick out in the middle of nowhere. I feel terrible right now. <clears throat> We've been riding all day for two days, pretty much, and we just uh, we just got into camp. <coughs> I can't even freaking breathe. <coughs> Not good. <coughs> It's day 10 in the Yukon, and brothers Chris and Casey Kiefer and their team of pack horses have finally made it to Tom Tom. From Boulder Camp and Sheep Country, the men have only dropped a few hundred feet in elevation, but the tall jagged mountains that looked over them 60 miles south are now replaced with high pines. Just got to camp, just checking on the meat, the sheep meat that we kept with us, it looks good. It's cold, that's good. Everything looks really good. So I'm gonna take the ham, the back roast out of this. These are the two hind quarters. And uh, I'm gonna take the back roast out of it, separate, separate it, and then take some of these flanks off and separate it so we can just slice them up. And Casey's getting a fire going and getting some stuff ready over there, so it should be good. Yeah. 
The early sun on day 10 has been replaced with rain, and as Chris exposes the meat to the damp weather, he cuts off enough of the hind quarter for a meal the brothers have been waiting all day for. Nothing renews hope in the bush like a meal over the open fire. Just trim it away. See, this is all the fatty pieces that are in there. Some of the dark stuff from aging over the last day or so. So this is just kind of waste meat right here. Once you trim it out, it's tender, it's good. We'll get this stuff butchered up and throw some on the grill. Sitting over there, Casey and I just cooked up some sheep. All of a sudden, we heard one of the horses just going crazy. And uh, we came over here, and sure enough, he was kicking like crazy. He was tangled in his halter shank, and he was getting hung on his neck. Was he was gonna choke? He was gonna die because the rope was around his neck, and he was hanging. And Casey took his knife out and cut the cut the rope. And he's fine. He's got a bad cut inside, but man, that was freaky. Part of having horses again. That's like four times today, these horses. You just don't know what's gonna happen. I don't know. It's crazy. Oh, we just had uh, had this horse kind of freak out a little bit and he got his leg wrapped up in this halter shackle. So he's around the tree and we actually had to cut it loose. Just got a little freaked out out here. But he's eating now, he seems to be doing better. He's got a little wound on his leg, but we're gonna get that taken care of. We got some some salve and stuff with us, some balm, so get it taken care of. He's all right now. As darkness falls over Tom Tom on the evening of day 10, storm clouds and thunder bring rain over the mountains in moose country, and brothers Chris and Casey Kiefer hunker down in their tent to weather the storm, hoping day 11 provides sun for the crew and a clean bill of health for Casey.
still sick. <clears throat> we got in here uh, yesterday and I was feeling really bad when we got in here. And it's, uh, it's pouring down rain today, so it's actually kind of a good thing because I can lay here in the tent and really not do much and <laughs> try and get rid of this thing so we can I can get back to getting after it like I want to. It sucks though. It's 6 p.m. and the low clouds that settled over Tom Tom all day have finally pushed out. As Casey continues to sleep off his fever in the tent, Chris glasses the valleys from camp, hoping to lay eyes on anything legal. sitting all day in glass and kind of, I don't know, just looking in and off between the, between the rain. In case he's been in, wrapped in his bag all day, I'm gonna check and make sure he's doing all right, see how he's doing. Mm -hmm. It's not really like him to be down and out all day. He's gotta be feeling pretty sick. Not a whole lot better. Is it just like full body chills or what? That's not good. You want me to build a fire in here? Because it's kind of chilly. You want me to get things going for you? you know, it's starting to clear off. The weather's starting to clear off, so it should be a good day tomorrow. So just keep sleeping. I'm just going to keep glassing. And... Do you want me to make you some sheep meat and bring it in? Are you hungry at all? Nothing? All right, all right. Well, I can stoke it up in here if you want. All right. As clouds continue to clear, temps drop, and with that, renewed hope for this camp and the high expectations the brothers put on themselves to complete the Yukon Slam they seek. Yesterday was an interesting day. We, uh, we made the changeover and we rode. We didn't get more than 20 minutes outside of camp and come up on two, two moose up on the side. We ran into some complications on the way over there. Uh, these horses, it's getting old on horses, I can tell you that much. Yesterday, a couple times, I mean, we had to cut one free from the tree, and and then we got into, the one almost bucked me off, the one did buck me off. I mean, bucked me right off the side and then came down and almost got me. Uh, it's a hard pounder, the last thing you wanna do is get up here, you're so cautious of everything you do, and then end up getting st uh, trampled by a horse. I'm gonna tell you something, we had some meat last night, some sheep meat, Again, we've got the two, we kept the two hind quarters and uh, in hopes that that's gonna be enough to cut down on weight because the horses can't carry a lot. Logan took the rest back with him. And those two hind quarters, that's some of the best meat I've ever had. I like sheep meat. I like it a lot. Over where I'm sitting right now, we can glass this whole valley. And this is a big valley. I mean, this is a huge valley. I've been watching it all day steady. And you think it's so vast, it's so open. You think that this would be the place where you'd see something for sure. I mean, how can something not cross? But then you realize how big the Yukon is. And it's just like Alaska. You're just not gonna see game around every corner. The pressure's mountain, no question. We got a lot of animals to knock down. We were given a mission. We're only one animal into that mission. We still got a lot to do. Day 12 in the Yukon begins like day 11 ended, with clear skies and cooler temperatures. 
As the brothers begin to prepare the horses for a day in moose country, a newfound sense of excitement is shared amongst the men. Well, I'm just getting the finishing touches put on Bruiser here. It's the first full day in moose caribou country. It's, uh, it's actually not too bad. I was pretty windy today, but yesterday was just miserable, cold and foggy, rainy all day. Couldn't see that hillside over there from here, so. I'm excited to get out there, start glassing. We need to get something down. We're starting to run out of time. We got a lot of animals left. So we need to get something down and get it down pretty quick. I feel a heck of a lot better today than I did yesterday. I don't know that cold, I think, hit its peak yesterday, the night before and into yesterday. So it was kind of nice having a down off day. I was able to just kind of stay in the tent. So I feel a hell of a lot better today. We get this stuff packed up and then we're out of here. Got up this morning. Beautiful weather, sun, just what we needed. Casey's feeling better. I'm ready to hunt. We should be ready to go today. We're gonna go up and glass off this one mountain off the side. We got about an hour, hour and a half ride on the horses, then we'll hike up the rest of the way. Then we're just gonna glass this whole valley. Just sit and take our time and just glass it. I mean, it's all you can do right now. It's not rut yet, so the moose aren't calling. Basically caribou and grizz are opportunity animals you just gotta watch out for. So that's the plan for today. Get moving on these guys. The brothers begin the two hour ride south in the valley to a vantage point they intend to spend the day glassing from. With the new territory comes new opportunities for game animals, leaving Chris and Casey with high hopes. Camp is way down that valley right there. We rode it, it's about a two hour ride. We're trying to get an advantage point right now, so we got one. We're just gonna hike up even more and then uh, glass. Hopefully we can come up something. My knees don't get out first. Hey, there's a, there's a grizz right there. A what? There's a grizz right there. See where that yellow comes up right there? Yeah. And then there's that shale, there's a grizz ball right there. She's up pretty high. Oh yeah, looks like a pretty good grizz though. That's a big bear. Where's that scope? Where's that scope? <laughs> we just got over here, just got up, tied the horses, popped down maybe five minutes, take a glass. I just spotted a grizz over here on the side of this hill. It's kind of heading up into that draw right there. He's but he looks looks like a pretty good grizz. Dark. Real nice color to him. He's still laying right there. Man, he looks like a dot over there, but he is big. We can either get on the back side of him, or by the time we get over there, he might move a little bit. We just have to keep watching him. If we get up that draw a little ways, though, we'll cut that behind. We'll cut that vertical in half down there. Yeah. I'm down. I'm ready. That's a big bear. Let's try and kill him. With more than enough daylight remaining to execute a stock on the giant grizzly, the brothers devise a plan. But things don't always go as expected in the rugged mountains of the Yukon North Country. 